Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Manju George, uh, the Medical Affairs Consultant at uh, the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. I'm really happy to be um, moderating this session on navigating clinical trials for colorectal cancer. Um, I have with me uh, an esteemed panel um, of, patient, of a patient uh, a clinician and a, um, the CEO of a trial finding company. So um, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a stage 3B rectal cancer survivor. I'm a veterinarian by training and used to be a biomedical researcher in my previous life. Um, and now I'm uh, involved in patient advocacy. Um, John, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, uh, my name is John Warner. I'm uh, uh, in my early 50s, uh, father of four, and uh, uh, navigating through stage four colorectal cancer. Thank you, John. Dr. Curtis Rock? Um, sure. It's my pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, I uh, specialize in clinical trials and precision medicine, and uh, my history involves uh, being a department chair of uh, probably one of the largest, if not largest, clinical uh, trials department in the world at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and uh, more recently having been uh, the director of the precision medicine program at uh, the University of California, uh, San Diego, and now uh, serving as the chief medical officer for the Worldwide Innovative Network uh, for Precision Medicine. And again, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, Zvia, do you want to introduce yourself? So, hey, my name is Zvia Bader. I'm a stage four melanoma survivor, so not colon cancer, but uh, also a techie all my life and as part of my journey, um, I've built trajectory as a decision support uh, platform for patients to help identifying our treatment option and help navigate through the complex decision of treatment. So nice to meet you all. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so let's start with our patient. Um, John, um, do you want to take us through your um, colorectal cancer journey? Sure, just briefly, um, I was originally diagnosed in September of 18. And as you see, I've been through a lot so far. Um, uh, did surgery and with surgery, I was staged at 3B, went through adjuvant treatment, went through monitoring, unfortunately had a recurrence, uh, went through more chemo uh, surgery. Um, and then following that, another recurrence. And that's when I uh, did my first clinical trial this summer. Okay. And um, did you have like the, um, how many cycles of K-Pox did you have? Tell us a little bit more. Oh, sure. Um, I had six months of K-Pox. So it, it was eight rounds every three weeks. Um, and that uh, I tolerated that very well. Um, and then went into surveillance and surveillance is, um, went through, you know, probably the standard regimen many go through of the scans, the colonoscopies, blood, blood draws, and things were uh, going smooth for, for about a year. Okay. So did you have it like every six months? Um, because at that time you were stage three, right? The surveillance, the, um, In my recollection is we were doing something every three months. Um, 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 whether it was a, a blood draw okay. or Maybe a blood scan draws. or something, it was something yeah. every three months. Okay. And then you said you found um, lung mets um, in June, 2020? Yeah. So in June of 2020 is uh, on a scan is when they found some uh, small lung mets. Um, and that summer is when I really began to uh, focus on clinical trials and, and with more focus. I had... Um, originally done some research, but that's where I tuned into it much more uh, as we assessed options for the stage four treatment. Okay, so we'll come back to the clinical trials in a bit. Um, Dr. Kurzrock, um, is like, so the, in, in John's case, he was diagnosed at, a, at an early stage first and then progressed to stage four. And uh, it's only after he became stage four and then went through chemo that he started thinking about clinical trials. Is that um, how it's common for patients? Um, yes, in my experience, um, patients don't start looking for clinical trials um, in general um, until the disease has uh, returned. 
Uh, and I, I think that's appropriate because in many patients, the disease does not return. And uh, in addition, uh, the field um, gratifyingly is moving so quickly now that uh, looking for a clinical trial and then if uh, the disease returns even in a year or two, the landscape of clinical trials may have changed uh, by then. Okay, so maybe first let's start by looking at, um, you know, the different phases of clinical trials. So um, shall we start there? Sure. Um, so uh, there are uh, four phases of clinical trials. Um, the first, uh, so this is the classic traditional uh, looking way of looking at clinical trials. The first phase is phase one, and that's when a drug comes from animals to humans for the first time. Uh, but phase one goes actually beyond that. And it's when you do anything new that hasn't been done before, maybe a new combination um, as well. Um, then in the, and, and the purpose of phase one is to look for responses and um, to understand the side effects of the drug. Then in phase two, uh, that is a larger sample size, I would say usually around 50 patients, uh, to ascertain uh, the, uh, if there are responses and enough responses uh, to uh, go into phase three. And phase three is usually a randomized trial where one looks at how the patients do on the new treatment versus standard of care. And then um, if, they, if the if phase three works out well, then that goes to FDA approval. And phase four is a post-approval, post-marketing uh, studies that the FDA might, might ask for to better establish uh, the efficacy or the side effects of a drug. Now, I want to emphasize that a lot of this has been turned on its head uh, recently, and we have several drugs now that have been approved um, after phase one studies, expand its phase one. So there's really an accelerated timeline for very efficacious drugs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Svea, this is um, a question for you. So you mentioned that um, you founded Trial Jectory. So do you want to tell us um, the founding story? How did you get to this point of uh, you know, finding a company to look for trials? So um, I've been a techie all my life. So that's what I was doing uh, before being diagnosed. And when I got my diagnosis of a, of a stage four and went to meet with the oncologist, he basically looked at me and said, well, you know, you're not doing too well. We need to see it in metastasized to the brain. Uh, there might be one clinical trial I can think of, but I need to see first. And, um, and, and let's do the brain MRI and come back to me and we'll take it from there. And for me, it was a very weird discussion. It was, first of all, why only one? Second of all, why clinical trial? Like any other patient, I was just like, why clinical trial? Nothing else out there to help me and, 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 uh, help me and that has already been shown to be working and i basically started to do my own investigation i realized that i'm not going to source outsource my journey to health i need to own it i need to make decisions that are right for me i need to make sure that i'm getting all my option and getting access to the best of treatment right the same way i'm not outsourcing a buying a house to a real estate agent right i go to zillow i see an option and then i work with him on what fits me best as an expert um, it became very clear to me that I need to start owning it. So I started doing the investigation. I've realized that, and I think as, as, as we were just pointed to, there is today so many more treatment options and a lot of the more advanced ones, the more targeted drugs uh, are, are actually being part of a clinical trial. So if I want access to the, to the newest drugs more, with more potential to be more effective, some of them with less side effects, then I need to look at clinical trial. Um, but it was very hard for me to look at them because they're so talking about precision medicine that was just missing. Each drug now of profiling the patient that is right for him, it's very complex to actually go comb over so many trials options, read through the description, understand for us as a patient if it's right for us. And for our oncologists, again, it's a very heavy duty kind of work to, to do. Um, and and I st and I started by by going to a very uh, and, and I started navigating my journey as 
knowing that I want to look at trials as an option, I relocated my case to a, a large, uh, large um, research center, uh, cancer center, not far from my home. I started my first clinical trial and like John, I did very well and managed to not have a recurrence for less than a year. And then uh, I had a recurrence. So I had to re revisit again and start investigating again. And it was so hard for me to identify and come challenge my oncologist with what option exists. Um, so I participated in a second trial that lasted nicely for a couple, for like a year and a half. And then I had my third recurrence and I participated in the third trial and actually that did the charm so far. Knock on wood, I've been uh, NED, non-visible disease for three and a half years now. And, and basically out of my own journey, I kind of said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to take all this tremendous innovation on the research, all those capabilities, all those really innovative drugs and bring them to the hands of the physician and the patient. Um, and as a techie, I basically build the machine using what is called artificial intelligence. It can read through those protocols and then match it, personalize it and match it to a patient, create a personalized list of trials that meets eligibility criteria. So the, remove the question of what out there from the table and go back to making truly what's right for me, uh, what makes sense at this point of my journey. Okay, thank you so much. So later in the session, we will see how um, you will walk us through how to use uh, the tool, right? So, uh, John, coming back to you, um, so Zvia told us about her experience. What was it like for you when you were looking for trials? Yeah, very similar. Um, uh, you know, I, was, I am uh, being treated at a major medical center, but still the doctors said, well, if you uh, come with a list of trials, we're happy to talk through the pros and cons of those with you. And, and here I was, uh, said, okay, how do I do that? And so I really reached out to, I'm, I'm a big believer in get as much facts on the table as you can. So uh, reached out to many different sources. Of course, I had had the, the, the Tempest and the other things done on my tumor. So I could look at those reports for some trials, went to clinicaltrials.gov, went to uh, Trial Trajectory, went to each major cancer center, saw what was available there and really tried to, it can be overwhelming um, and really tried to assemble my short list of things that might fit um, and discuss those with my oncologist. And um, importantly, as Zia said, learning pretty quickly, you need to own it yourself, right? No one's going to own it with as much passion as you will about your own self, but then also leverage what resources are out there because it is a huge learning curve to learn what all these things are. Um, and many, many resources, whether it be the Colon Town Clinical Trials Group or uh, CC Alliance or others, I just read a lot and it kept educating me on uh, what the different biomarkers mean, what TMB importance of that is, what importance of microsatellite status is. And um, all of those things help inform choices um, for, for trials. Um, and um, the other thing that Dr. Kurzog said, which is important is, um, timing matters a lot, right? And so, um, unfortunately, as a patient, you don't have your choice of trial. You have your choice of what's available at that time that fits for you. Um, and in my case, I, um, when I, in April of this year, was looking for a clinical trial, my oncologist suggested trying an immunotherapy trial with a cancer vaccine. And thankfully, I was screened and fit and uh, found one at the National Institute of Health. Um, it wasn't per se targeted at my mutation, which is KRAS. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, um, maybe John, we can come to the trials in a bit um, and maybe we can take a pause and then um, one, two, three. Um, I'll have the question back to Dr. Kurzrock. Um, Dr. Kurzrock, you've done a, a ton of work on developing phase one trials and, um, you know, you, you, you always talk so passionately about those trials. And I know that there are a lot of misconceptions among patients about phase one trials. Um, could you um, tell us more about your work? Um, sure. Um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so... Uh... When I was um, a department chair at MD Anderson, I was charged uh, with building a new department, which was uh, early phase uh, trials. And uh, at the time, this was 2004, 
And still today, um, uh, people thought about phase one trials, you know, these uh, new drugs that had just been in animals or sometimes new combinations that um, the purpose of the trials was to determine toxicity. It wasn't to determine um, uh, efficacy. And uh, we really tried to turn that on its head. Um, we wanted efficacy. Uh, our purpose was not to look at side effects. And so I, I think, um, uh, and I'm happy to have been a part of that, but I think this has really been revolutionized. Uh, phase one trials are now, um, sure, we want to understand what the side effects are of the drug, but I, I believe the primary purpose is to uh, understand if the drug has efficacy. And um, I still hear, um, it's almost 20 years later, uh, people saying, oh, phase one trials, they're not about response rates. Uh, that is a very, very old fashioned way of thinking. Um, uh, phase one trials are about looking for response indicators. And it's gone so far, I alluded to this uh, before, uh, but it's gone far enough that there are now two drugs uh, that the FDA has approved after phase one. Uh, so uh, if there is striking enough efficacy, it can even go uh, to FDA approval. Uh, so I think that's the main uh, concept, misconception about phase one, um, that we're not looking for responses. Um, uh, maybe somebody else isn't looking for responses, but anybody doing modern phase one trials is absolutely looking for responses. So these are some of the common phase one miscon misconceptions, right? Right, and this puts it um, uh, very nicely. Um, so I want to add something to this because it's on the slide. I think it's um, very important. Um, so we uh, uh, phase one drugs are in, ineffective at low doses. So one of the complaints about phase one is for safety reasons, especially if you take a drug from animals to humans, you start at low doses and then you go to higher doses. So there, um, there in the past, when we gave chemotherapy, we, with chemotherapy, the higher the dose, uh, the more effective the chemotherapy. So one of the complaints, and this is again, it's an old complaint, it's 20 years old, but doesn't apply to the modern era, is that we start at low doses. So those low doses are, um, those patients at the low doses are wasting their time. Uh, they're doing something altruistic, but not for themselves. But this isn't true anymore with chemotherapy. And we actually, um, wrote a paper, the paper is almost a decade old now, but that patients um, on phase one trials at low doses don't do worse. In fact, if you look at the statistics, the trend is for them to do better. And that's because modern day drugs are not like uh, chemotherapy. You don't need higher doses. You need just to hit the target. Um, the other thing is um, the idea that phase one drugs are toxic. Um, at least in cancer, we have so many built-in safeguards um, that the rate of uh, uh, drug-related death, um, and these are cancer patients with um, really end-stage cancer. Uh, the median survival is nine months to a year in these patients, um, and the rate of toxic deaths is, in most studies, less than 1%. Um, so almost uh, like we'd like it to be zero, but almost negligible in a very difficult um, uh, group of patients. And I already addressed the myth about uh, that we're not looking for efficacy. We are actually, we are absolutely looking for efficacy. You want to go back 30 years? Maybe we weren't looking for efficacy, but uh, we're in a new era now. And we have been for at least 15 years. Okay, and I think the next slide is about precision medicine. And um, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, so um, precision medicine, uh, I think is the new way of doing things. And we really couldn't do this um, even a decade ago. Uh, but um, the bottom line with precision medicine versus our old way of doing things is, so in the old way of doing things, 
uh, we would look at a population of patients, maybe a hundred patients, maybe a thousand patients. And we would say, oh, this drug works in 20% of patients, or this work drug works in 40% of patients. Uh, therefore the FDA should approve this drug. But we never knew which patients it was that the drug was effective in. And that's because we really didn't have the tools. But with the sequencing of the genome, which everybody said was impossible, was never going to happen. But then that was in the 1990s. And then it was sequenced about uh, uh, 2003. Um, and now we have sequencing that we can do on a regular basis. We've done it on thousands and thousands of patients. We can actually understand what is going on in each patient's tumor, and we can customize the therapy uh, to that patient. Uh, so we don't have to go by population averages, which is what we had to do um, 20 years ago because we didn't have any tools to do it differently. Um, and so I don't care if the patient sitting in front of me um, has a, a genomic landscape that is one in a thousand. It's just extraordinarily rare. That's okay, because now I know what's wrong with that patient, and I don't really care about the other 999 patients that aren't sitting in front of me. Yeah, and then this was the other point that you were saying, right? Um, yes, and I think this is very important. Um, and this has been what has been so gratifying um, about these new drugs that are developed um, with deep bio biologic uh, understanding, but not only are the drugs um, uh, really uh, targeted and uh, targeting something um, that, that is driving the tumors, but um, we can also pick the patients that have that abnormality that can be targeted by the drugs. And that means that even in end stage patients, uh, we can have much higher response rates um, than what we would have by blindly treating patients. So this is slide is um, probably over a decade old now, but it still gives the message. Um, and what you see on the right-hand side is if you randomly give phase one drugs the way we used to give uh, to patients without any matching, without understanding their individual genomic landscape, uh, the response rate's about 5%. It's pretty negligible. And uh, uh, this is a waterfall plot, uh, but uh, I've circled the area that shows the responses. But if you go on to the left-hand side, even with first-generation sequencing, um, so this is not um, the most sophisticated next generation sequencing that we have now, but this was uh, first generation when we first started doing this at MD Anderson. Again, this is over a decade old. You can visually see how um, understanding what is wrong in a patient's individual tumor and matching them with the right drugs uh, can be much more effective in getting responses. Um, and um, so this leads to something that is really important, and that's the reclassification of cancer. And uh, historically, the way I've done things, the way everybody's done things, the way things are still done um, is we talk about colon cancer, we talk about melanoma, or we talk about breast cancer, or we talk about lung cancer. Um, and and um, we did that because we were looking under the light microscope and what the light microscope does is, is it looks at the surfaces of the cells and then the pathologist can tell you where the cancer came from. And um, the, they can tell you the cancer came from the colon, it came from the lung. But what we've now discovered is what I call the molecular microscope and that's next generation sequencing. And that doesn't look just at the surface of the cell. It looks into the cell at the program, basically the human computer program, which is the DNA, and it figures out uh, what has gone wrong in the code. And then um, we can treat based on what has gone wrong in the code. And what we've discovered is you can have a colon cancer patient and a lung cancer patient, and they have the exact same abnormality um, in the code. And um, it's more important what is wrong in their code, in their DNA, than whether the uh, tumor came from the colon 
or the tumor came from the lung. The essential is to understand what is wrong in that tumor. And of course, we've gone way beyond genomics. We can look at the immune environment and so forth. So this means that the clinical trial design has really evolved quickly. quickly. And um, we've gone from uh, sort of old fashioned clinical design uh, that lung cancer was one disease. And now we begin to understand that lung cancer is actually many different diseases and it's defined by the molecular uh, subsets. Um, and furthermore, when we look at the molecular abnormalities, which I alluded to before, which are abnormalities in DNA or RNA, et cetera, you can have the same abnormality in different types of cancer, like lung cancer, colon cancer, um, even brain tumors. And uh, those um, abnormalities will respond to the same drug, uh, regardless of the organ in which the abnormality uh, originated. So this is the stage one of redesigning cancer trials, redesigned on the basis of the molecular abnormality. Um, and therefore we've gone in stage one from these big randomized trials, which I grew up thinking these are the gold standard. And uh, what we expect is a small number of patients uh, will respond. And why did we need a randomized trial? Uh, because um, uh, the response, the difference in responses between the two arms was not visually obvious. So you need these big trials to see which drugs are better. But now we've moved to these small trials uh, that are very focused on the patients that have the right abnormalities. And it, it can be very visually obvious. Some of these drugs have response rates of 70, 80%. Instead of looking at uh, response rates, one, uh, one arm has 18 and the other has 21% and which is better. These are visually obvious response rates. Um, so this has given birth to a new era, and this is FDA approvals based on uh, genomics, and their approvals across solid tumor. So the first one, and this is where the FDA broke the glass, uh, was for uh, immunotherapy for microsatellite unstable uh, patients. Uh, so this approval is for all solid tumors, not for colon cancer or breast cancer. It's for any approval. It was the first time an approval um, was based on a genomic marker across cancers. And it's very interesting that this is for an immunotherapy. Um, and uh, immunotherapy and genomics are considered separately, but it's actually genomics that often defines which patients will respond to immunotherapy. So uh, that was the first approval. It's not uh, the last. Uh, there's now been um, actually five other approvals. I don't think I have all five of them, but I named three of them uh, here, larotrectinib and entrectinib for NTRAC fusion uh, positive patients. Uh, again, an approval across solid tumors. It doesn't matter. Do you have lung cancer? Do you have breast cancer? Uh, do you have melanoma? It really doesn't matter. Uh, the approval is based on the underlying code abnormalities, the underlying DNA abnormalities, and then another approval for immunotherapy, uh, again, across solid tumors. So this is the really new era. And um, I think, but I'm going to say that it's only stage one. And a little later, I'll get into stage two, which gets us into um, throat catapults us even into a more sophisticated uh, way of looking at tumors. Okay, Th thank you so much, Dr. Kristrak. So we go back to John. Um, um, and um, so I was kind of wondering, uh, you know, as part of your journey, what, what messages you have for other patients um, in the same situation as you are? Sure. Um... As has been talked about, knowing your biomarkers and uh, early is important. I remember even when I was earlier stage, uh, some doctors would say to me, well, that's only really relevant if you're stage four. And I said, well, let's make sure we do the genomic work so I know now and I can start reading in the event I do become stage four. So your mutations, your microsatellite stability, your tumor mutational burden, all that is important to know and, and have done on your tumors. Um, consider clinical trials early on. As again, I first thought about them in summer of 2020. At that point, um, 
uh, there were still standard of care options. And so we, together with my oncologist, decided to do the Fulfirinox and the Avastin. Um, uh, but then when I had the recurrence this year, um, I had already been researching then for a year, was much more educated on options. And that's when my oncologist said, let's explore a cancer vaccine trial with immunotherapy. And, um, and so I just er educate yourself on your biomarkers and what trials might and what drugs and approaches have been working or have shown promise so that um, if the time comes that you need it, you've already done that level of legwork. Um, as I mentioned earlier, owning the process yourself, certainly leveraging every resource you can can access, uh, but uh, no one's going to own it as passionately as you are about your own health and well-being. Some of those key resources, trial directory, which I know we'll talk about a bit more, clinicaltrials.gov, many, many search engines. Again, in my experience, and these each of these are in different stages of development, um, I didn't, one of my frustrations was none of them seemed to be the source that had all the trials. So I would use many of the search engines and also reach out to the major cancer centers and build my own list uh, of ones that fit me, um, leveraging networks like Colorectal Cancer Alliance, Colin Town and others, um, just to, to, to build my knowledge base, that's important. I, uh, in my experience so far, trial trajectory has been the best I've found in terms of focus of using that data to be as precise as possible on which trials fit you. Um, um, so I think that's important. And then, you know, some advice I was given and I, I try to follow, I don't know that I follow it perfectly, is really trying to balance treatment, researching your next options and living. Um, as one doctor said to me, which was hard medicine, but uh, it was hard advice to get, but I think it's right, is look, you are, you are tra in, in your search on trials, um, some of them could be great and hopefully be the cure like it was uh, for someone on the call here. Uh, but you're also balancing time you have now with a chance for time later. And so make sure as you're exploring those, they're ones that have the greatest promise with this precision medicine, and um, you're also living uh, as you go through it. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Dr. Krishna, coming back to you it's for the second part uh, of you know where things are going and when patients are looking for trials, what are some of the things to keep in mind? Sure, thank you. Uh, so um, I want to go through what I think is the modern era of uh, clinical trials, um, and that is precision medicine. And put in its most simple way, um, it is um, understanding, as I emphasized before, what is wrong in a patient's own tumor and um, fitting the trial to the patient. Uh, historically, we fit the patient to the trial, uh, but that uh, we don't need to do anything anymore. The trial should not be the center of the universe. The patient should be the center of the universe. And uh, so the pillars of precision medicine or personalized medicine right now are genomics, our immunotherapy, and people think of them separately, but they're actually a couple and they're married to each other. Um, and uh, the way that we've done this is uh, because uh, the genomics, the molecular, the immune, this is so new uh, for most patients is that we have a molecular, uh, while we were at UCSD, uh, we had a molecular tumor board. We had the equivalent at MD Anderson. I'm now uh, leading some national molecular tumor boards. Uh, these are multidisciplinary discussions of patients. And it's all about um, understanding what's wrong in each individual tumor and uh, matching the patient to the right drugs. Um, not trying to find patients for clinical trials, but trying to find clinical trials for patients. And it's also new, using novel technologies, not just tissue biopsies, but we have these amazing technologies that were unimaginable a decade ago. We can take a a little vial of blood and know the genomics in the tumor. And um, my own experience is uh, close to 6,000 um, 
uh, patient samples with the liquid biopsy program and over 20,000 uh, tissue genomics uh, samples. So we've really had a lot of experience with doing this and I think is absolutely transformative. And I talked before about stage one, how we began to match patients um, based on individual alterations across cancers uh, to drugs. Uh, but um, I wanna talk about stage two. Uh, because this is where um, we've moved to, and it, this is really important. Um, I, you know, I live in San Diego, but I grew up in Canada, and so I know a little bit about snowflakes. And um, snowflakes um, uh, are analogous to tumors. If you look at the snowflake crystal structure, each one of them is uh, very complicated, and they're all different from each other. And that's exactly what we find with metastatic uh, cancers. Um, when we look at the uh, omic landscape of the cancer, each one of them is different and each one of them is really complicated. And um, just like, you know, if I look at people on the screen, we all look really different. Well, so do tumors. And this means that um, the way we've approached tumors in the past is probably not the right way, but it's really difficult to make this change. But the science is telling us that we have to make the change. So I so this is just like made up patients, but it's a pretty good representation. Um, so when you do uh, genomics, you find that patients have multiple alterations. They don't have one alteration. And uh, patients one and two both have KRAS. And even in the modern era, stage one, so we're gonna find uh, them a trial that uh, they both go on uh, that hits KRAS. But if you look at this, I think it's pretty obvious that that's not the right thing to do. Yes, we wanna hit KRAS, but each of these patients has other things wrong with their tumor. So do, we don't wanna hit KRAS by itself. And it's pretty obvious that these two patients should not go on the same drug regimen because they don't have the same things wrong with their tumor. Each of these patients needs more than one drug and each of these patients needs a, drug, a different drug regimen that is customized to them. That is not something we ever did in the past, but we actually started doing it in 2015 um, at UCSD. And this is what I'm talking about, drug-centric versus patient-centric trials. Historically, for most of my life as an oncologist, because we didn't have tools, the, um, the trial is the center of the universe, and then we find patients to fit on the trial. But this turns it on its head. We make the patient the center of the universe, and now we're going to fit the drugs to the patient. We're not going to put the patient to the trial. We're going to fit the drugs to the patient, and every patient is going to get a different set of drugs based on what is specifically wrong with their tumor. So again, this was like uh, uh, breaking the glass. Uh, so we started this trial in 2015. We called it I Predict for investigation of profile-related evidence determining individualized cancer therapy. I'll tell you, it took us two years to get it through the IRB. Uh, it took us two years from 2013 to 2015, uh, but we've now published three papers on it. And the idea here was for the first time, we were gonna do profiling on every patient and we were gonna fit the drugs to the patient um, everybody would get an individualized regimen and it wouldn't be just one drug. Uh, we would do a combination of drugs. Uh, we published the first paper in Nature Medicine in 2019 now. Uh, we've published a second paper in Nature Communications in 2020 and about a week or two ago, we published a third paper in Genome Medicine. We, so we've really done this already on probably close to 2000 patients and the publications probably um, uh, include about 1,000 patients. And this is what we're um, learning. We're going to make a tumor equivalent to a table and we wanna collapse that table, okay? So look at that table here. This is one type of tumor. And in order to collapse this particular table, you just need to take out that um, one uh, pole that's holding them up. But let's look at the next table. The next table is not so easy to collapse. If we take out that central pole, it does nothing. The table stands just fine. And even if we take out the four um, side uh, poles, the table will still stand because the single middle pole is standing. So in order to collapse this other table, we actually need to take out everything. 
um, in order to get it to collapse. Uh, so everybody's uh, tumor is a different table. Um, and we didn't know that before because we didn't have the tools, but now we have the tools and we can understand, we don't understand the science perfectly yet, um, but we can understand that in order to collapse different tumors, we can't use the same methodology. And while the upper left uh, table needs only one drug to collapse it, in essence, the um, table on the right needs five drugs to collapse it. Um, so we uh, realize that not all therapy matches are created equal. And um, this shows the first readout from nature medicine studies. So these are patients with highly refractory cancers that got customized uh, therapy. And uh, what you can see is that the response rates um, in patients that were highly matched, and these are customized combinations, everybody getting their own, uh, they, the patients um, had response rates close to 50%, the patients with low or no matches um, closer to 15%. And then the survival was where we really saw some, uh, what I think, striking differences. These end-stage patients, the two-year survival was 60% in the highly matched patients. It was about only about 20% in the patients that were low matched. So I'm going to give you some examples of customized therapy. Um, and remember, we don't know how to do this perfectly. But um, I think what's important with what we're doing here is that we, again, broken the glass. Uh, we're, we're changing the way of doing things. Uh, so this is a 41 year old woman with metastatic colorectal cancer. And you can see that she has a bunch of different alterations. Um, and uh, so what we elected to do is to match as many alterations as that we could. Um, and so we gave her what would be considered a pretty unusual regimen uh, for uh, metastatic colorectal cancer. She'd had um, uh, fall fox in the past, capecitabine, uh, irinotecan, and regorafenib, which are kind of usual regimens. And uh, so we gave her Cylindec, which is a... Um, anti-inflammatory pain medicine. We gave her bevacizumab or abastin, um, which is a, a drug used in colorectal cancer. And we gave her trametinib, which can hit the KRAS. Uh, so this is a customized regimen trying to hit as many of the abnormalities as possible with the best drugs that we have. And, none of, and some of these drugs are definitely not perfect yet um, for this type of uh, 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 targeted approach. So um, so this woman uh, got this regimen. Uh, she had a, after having failed uh, several different therapies, uh, she had a partial response uh, that lasted um, 18 months. So of course, not perfect. Our science is imperfect. But the uh, point here is even in patients that have failed multiple regimens, we can customize their therapy um, in ways that would normally be considered unusual and uh, really get uh, nice responses that last, in this case, a year and a half. Uh, of course, some patients do, uh, don't do that well, and some patients do really well. I have patients uh, that are six years out in complete remission. Not that many, we wanna have everybody like that, but the idea is to customize. And then I just wanna finish by saying um, that um, uh, we've concentrated on genomics because the technology has moved uh, so quickly in a breathtaking way in genomics, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to be looking at RNA, which is transcriptomics, proteomics, epigenetics. And as we put that all together, I think we will truly be able to collapse each of these tables, which is collapsing each of these tumors. Um, so thank you, and I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you so much for that, Dr. Kurzrock. So um, we went through like the patient experience and then we looked at phase one trials and then we looked at some of the ways in which the clinical trial, um, you know, terrain is changing. So now um, before we end, we will go and find out from Zvia how um, trial trajectory can help patients. Um, Zvia, up to you. So as was said here, clinical trial, the research is showing have, have for, offer better outcome to majority of the patient. Uh, it does offer more innovative approaches to treatment, more the targeted and, and, and biomarker related. So knowing your option, in my opinion, is key at any given point. What we try to do in trajectory is make it simple and easier uh, 
then the process John had to go through and I had to go through and we constantly improve, right? Um, so we've developed, like I've mentioned before, this AI-based technology that can read through treatment protocols. So we connect to clinicaltrials.gov and the NCA database. So all those places where they're publishing trials protocol, our machine is connected to and reads through it. So we do the heavy lifting of reading through a lot of treatment protocols uh, to identify the right fit to a patient. So a patient comes in, he builds his profile, basically telling us about the disease characteristic. If he had NGS testing, what are was those biomarker type, subtype? If he hasn't, by the way, we encourage him to get it done and as, as to make sure that he has more option open for him. Treatment history um, and response, other health issues. So everything we need to know about a patient and following this dynamic questionnaire that changed based on your everybody's different journey. But at the end of it, the typical five minutes, you get matched to trials that fits your profile. So we've done the browsing of the internet and give you this concise list. The second thing we've done and we've realized, and I've hinted to it and John, is that giving me just a list doesn't necessarily help me enough as a patient. I need to understand it. We're not medical professionals as much as we spend time educating ourselves. We need also the ability to understand it in our language. So our machine also curate the information to a more patient friendly language so we can understand the type of treatment it is. Uh, going to the example just giving, it's a KRAS targeted, it's a PDL1 uh, targeted. Uh, what is, and, and show easily what is the goal of the study, how treatment is giving, uh, treatment cycles, so all the information we need to know. And where is it running? And of course, there is a learn more. So you can see all the more details and get more acquainted and understand them. You can then easily share it with your oncologist. So you can have those discussion with them about those options. The list is also being organized in a, in, a, in a way that it's easy to navigate, A, based on location, how far it is to from wherever I am, and also following uh, the clinical logic. So starting to implement some of the clinical logic of targeted above something that is more wide, a combo versus a mono, the more we, we hit those points in your profile, uh, then it will get higher rating and will be at the top of the list versus something else. We don't stop there. We also have a team that can help support patient. We don't, we're not replacing oncologists. We're not there to make the medical decision, but we know that in order to have the dialogue, and make a decision, you need to understand your options. So if you want to, if a patient want to talk to one of our team members, better understand how the active uh, ingredients working, what's the logic behind the combo? If it's a phase two or phase three, what was the result of phase one? Get better understanding, share more about his condition and get more data points that he can take, then take into account in his decision-making. We're there to support them. All the way to when a patient made a decision with his oncologist, they want to apply to a a trial, we know it's difficult to go to the site, talk to the trial coordinator, we help coordinate it, make sure that they get back to you, schedule those meetings. So really virtually, we and the CCA team hold the hands of the patient and they're there safely placed wherever it is and start their treatment. And we're always there. So if treatment fell or you decided not to apply to a treatment or something changed in the status, you go back, you update your profile, you get new notificate, you get new trial match. If there wasn't a good trial, but then something new have been added, like was inted, research is going in a pace we've never seen before. So I think it's weird to say, but we're lucky to be patient at this era versus my mom that, you know, passed in within six months from the point of diagnosis, because there was very little option back then. You all, you'll get notified that there's a new trial that you match your profile and again, get notified on the information. And this way you can always keep up to date and know your option even before you get your next scan results. Um, and I think it's all about really personalized medicine, having option, knowing your option and make the best decision for you as a patient. Okay, thank you so much, Svia. Uh, I hope this went well and um, I hope the audience and the people watching the video have um, some understanding of the faces of the clinical trials. We They were able to see a patient journey and learn from Dr. Kurzrock about all the you know, improvements and innovations and where clinical trials are going and that Zvia has been able to um, show them how to use the trial trajectory. And I hope that um, everyone can, you know, have learned something from this session and is able to use the information in their own um, cancer journeys. Thank you very much.
that was a very informative um, discussion. So now let's look at some of the questions. Um, so the first question is for you, Zvia. Um, is there a one-stop shop where we can look at all the available clinical trials? So I hope anybody who saw me last speak saw it. It's absolutely, if you go to CCA website, there is a clinical trial finder. Using our tool, the trail trajectory tool, you're able to see all the clinical trials options that exist that match your condition. So we do all the heavy lifting. It's not just searching for you based on keywords, but actually the reason we're asking you to build a profile is that we match them. What you're being presented with is the options that fits your profile, and then you can act upon them. You can talk with your oncologist, talk to your care one, talk to our team, and then or being or talk to the different sites where the files are running. We can connect you to those sites and make sure that you are getting your answer your question answer and being able to take action based upon. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Kristoff, this question is for you. Um, how many lines of treatment should a patient go through before they can start looking at trials? Uh, that's a really good question. I think that a patient should start looking at trials um, as soon as they find they have advanced disease. I mean, um, it's even worth looking at trials earlier than that, uh, but but often there's not a lot of trials um, in the uh, what we call the adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting. But as soon as a patient finds uh, that their uh, disease is spread or the doctor suspects that it will spread, um, I think that's a time that uh, both the physician and the patient should be thinking about uh, what's out there, but clinical trials are available. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we have another question about insurance. Um, how does insurance play in if you're being treated locally but decide to travel out of state to participate in a trial? Well, I will say that I am not an insurance specialist. But um, I do have a lot of experience with patients traveling from out of state, um, having worked at MD Anderson and uh, to a bit lesser extent at University of California. Uh, so first of all, it, a lot of patients are older and if you're under Medicare, um, it really shouldn't have an effect at all. Uh, Medicare wrote into law actually when Bill Clinton was president, that uh, they will cover uh, the expenses of clinical trials um, uh, that, uh, that is covered completely. And, and many insurances uh, follow that as well. Um, I think where a patient um, needs to check um, is if they're, uh, you know, they've got non-Medicare insurance and sometimes those insurance policies will limit uh, where they can go. Uh, to see a doctor. So it's usually not a limitation on clinical trials specifically. It's usually they say these are the doctors that you're allowed to see and the doctor's not allowed to see. Um, it usually doesn't say these are the clinical trials that will allow and or not allow. So if they allow you to go to the center, um, you are very likely, you have to check, but you're very likely to be eligible uh, for uh, any clinical trials at the center that you're allowed to see. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this next question is about any advice or ideas on being able to access or encourage decentralized trials to reduce burden on patients. Uh, you're asking me. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know how to encourage it, but I think it's one of the... Uh, Really important things going on, and I'm uh, I'm actually the principal investigator now on three decentralized trials uh, with different um, uh, sort of different models. Um, so I don't know how to encourage them, but but um, I think this is a new thing that is going to become very important. And so the the trials have a home. Uh, but the patient, uh, the pa trials have a central home, but the patients don't have to travel to an academic center. Uh, the patient's doctor, wherever they are, um, they can uh, put the patients on the trials. Now, unfortunately, one thing that we've run into is that um, some academic centers, and I can sort of understand why, um, don't want their doctors to put the patients on these trials um, because they feel strongly that uh, clinical trials should be in academic centers. So I think that, uh, but I think for the patient well-being, they're really much better off at home. 
uh, than traveling halfway around the country. Uh, so, so some of this is going to need to be worked out. I'm actually pretty confident that the new model will be decentralized trials where the trial comes to the patient and the patient stays at home. Uh, and, and then the last thing I'll say is this may be a little bit difficult for extremely complicated trials where you really need a support uh, system, um, but uh, uh, at least 50% of the trials, maybe more, I think this should uh, be easily doable, the home-based system. Okay, thank you very much. And I, do you, and do you I, have something to add? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And, 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 and what we're seeing in the industry now is a trend towards being more accommodated to the patient needs. And the way we encourage the pharmaceutical company to do so is actually by driving patients to them. So even if a patient maps the trial, but cannot actually participate because of distance, we're flagging it to the pharmaceutical companies and the, and the sponsor and trying to push them to find a way to do it decentralized, partially virtual, to remove some of the burden of the travel. Now, one of the problems they have so far is exactly as we mentioned before, right? They're used to working with the research centers and they're not sure where all those patients are and they can't just reach out to all the community oncologists out there. So by flipping the model, by having new patients come in, identifying the trials that you match and want to apply, we can actually push the pharmaceutical company. And I can tell you they're very receptive to it, understanding that patients are now more active and are willing to make some adjustment to a lot of the trials and models. Um, so that's part of the agenda that we're pushing on the, on the sponsor side. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a couple of minutes left and I want to ask John. John, do you have any um, parting words or a ma message for patients who are watching? I'd say uh, continue to kind of reach out to the, the CC Alliance Network and others. Use these resources we've all talked about and um, uh, really own your own case because uh, that will make the difference. Uh, keep educating yourself with all these great resources. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Kurzweil, what about you? What advice do you have? Well, I, I really agree. I agree with John, but I'm going to add something to that. Um, and that's find a physician that um, uh, is not only knowledgeable, but agrees with your philosophy um, and wants to, and is not, and, and will know the clinical trials, will know the type of things that, you, that you're looking for. Um, I think that um, that is really key because uh, a knowledgeable physician can really help you find um, and, and should know about what you need, but you have to be aligned in philosophy uh, with your physician. Okay, and you suggest that um, in search of cl clinical trials, patients should um, you know, start looking for you know, at second opinion consults wherever possible initially? I think that a uh, second opinion is always a really um, good idea. And here, I think physicians at um, major academic centers often can be very helpful because they have a broad um, overview of what clinical trials may be available. Okay, thank you very much. And then um, the last question for you, um, Dr. Kristoff, what, what does your ideal trial look like? What, what, what is, if you, if you could design the best trial possible, what would that look like? Um, so I'm, I'm a very strong believer in individualized therapy and the trial would have um, uh, intense uh, omic uh, interrogation of each tumor. Uh, so we'd look at, uh, so the trial would look at the immune profile, it would look at genomics, it would look at transcriptomics and the intention uh, would be to um, customize the therapy for the patient. In other words, not find the patient for the trial, but what I mentioned in my le lecture, absolutely customize uh, the therapy after, um, after the profiling is done. So we know what's wrong with that individual tumor and give the best therapy, the best drugs for that particular tumor. You don't care if you're one in a million. Uh, we want to treat that one in a million. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this has been a very informative session. I'd like to thank all the participants and thank, thank you for, a, for an amazing discussion. And um, everyone have a good evening. And thank you. This has uh, been very good.